This, however, occurred much later. In the meantime, I took sanctuary in that serene old ship early every evening. The only person on board that seemed to be in trouble was little Lena, and in due course I perceived that the health of the rag doll was more than delicate. This object led a sort of in extremis existence in a wooden box placed against the starboard mooring bits, tended and nursed with the greatest sympathy and care by all the children who greatly enjoyed pulling long faces and moving with hushed footsteps. Only the baby, Nicholas, looked on with a cold ruffianly leer, as if he had belonged to another tribe altogether. Lena perpetually sorrowed over the box, and all of them were in dead earnest. It was wonderful the way these children would work up their compassion for that bedraggled thing, I wouldn't have touched it with a pair of tongs. I suppose they were exercising and developing their racial sentimentalism by the means of that dummy. I was only surprised that Mrs. Hermann let Lena cherish and hug that bundle of rags to that extent. It was so disreputably and completely unclean. But Mrs. Hermann would raise her fine womanly eyes from her needlework to look on with amused sympathy and did not seem to see it. Somehow, that this object of affection was a disgrace to the ship's purity. Purity, not cleanliness, is the word. It was pushed so far that I seemed to detect in this, too, a sentimental excess, as if dirt had been removed in very love. It is impossible to give you an idea of such a meticulous neatness. It was as if every morning that ship had been arduously explored with toothbrushes. Her very bowsprit three times a week had its toilet made with a cake of soap and a piece of soft flannel. Arrayed, I must say arrayed, arrayed artlessly in dazzling white paint as to wood and dark green as to ironwork, and simple-minded distribution of these colors evoked the images of simple-minded peace, of Arcadian felicity, and the childish comedy of disease and sorrow struck me sometimes as an abominably real blot upon the ideal state. I enjoyed it greatly, and on my part I brought a little mild excitement into it. Our intimacy arose from the pursuit of that thief. It was in the evening, and Hermann, who, contrary to his habits, had stayed on shore late that day, was extricating himself backwards of a little gary on the river bank opposite his ship when the hunt passed. Realizing the situation as though he had eyes in his shoulder blades, he joined us with a leap and took the lead. The Chinaman fled, silent like a rapid shadow on the dust of an extremely oriental road, I followed, a long way in the rear, my mate whooped like a savage. A young moon threw a bashful light on a plain like a monstrous waste ground. The architectural mass of a Buddhist temple far away projected itself in dead black on the sky. We lost the thief, of course, but in my disappointment I had to admire Hermann's presence of mind. The velocity that stodgy man developed and the interests of a complete stranger earned my warm gratitude. There was something truly cordial in his exertions. He seemed as vexed as myself at our failure and would hardly listen to my thanks. He said it was nothings and invited me on the spot to come on board his ship and drink a glass of beer with him. We poked skeptically for a while amongst the bushes peered without conviction into a ditch or two. There was not a sound. Patches of slime glimmered feebly amongst the reeds. Slowly we, we trudged back, drooping under the thin sickle of the moon, and I heard him mutter to himself, Himmel, zwi und drissig profund. He was impressed by the figure of my loss. For a long time we had ceased to hear the mate's whoops and yells. Then he said to me, Everybody has his troubles, and as we went on, remarked that he would never have known anything of mine hadn't he by an extraordinary chance been detained on shore by Captain Falk. He didn't like to stay late ashore, he added with a sigh. 
The something doleful in his tone I put on his sympathy with my misfortune, of course. On board the Diana, Mrs. Hermann's fine eyes expressed much interest and commiseration. We had found the two women sewing face to face under the open skylight and the strong glare of the lamp. Hermann walked in first, starting in the very doorway to pull off his coat, and encouraging me with loud, hospitable ejaculations. Come in, this way. Come in, Captain. At once, coat in hand, he began to tell his wife all about it. Mrs. Hermann put the palms of her plump hands together. I smiled and bowed with a heavy heart. The niece got up and from her sewing to bring Hermann's slippers and his embroidered collot, which he assumed pontifically, talking about me all the time. Billows of white stuff lay between the chairs on the cabin floor. I caught the words Zwi und Drissig Pfund repeated several times, and presently came the beer, which seemed delicious to my throat parched with running and the emotions of the chase. I didn't get away till well past midnight, long after the women had retired. Hermann had been trading in the east for three years or more, carrying the freights of rice and timber mostly. His ship was well known in all the ports of, from Vladivostok to Singapore. She was his own property. The profits had been moderate, but the trade answered well enough while the children were small yet. In another year or so, he hoped he would be able to sell the old Diana and to a firm in Japan for a fair price. He intended to return home to Bremen by mailboat, second class, with Mrs. Hermann and the children. He told me all this stolidly, with slow puffs at his pipe. I was sorry when, knocking the ashes out, he began to rub his eyes. I would have sat with him till morning. What had I to hurry on board my own ship for? To face the broken rifle drawer in my stateroom? Ugh! The very thought made me feel unwell. I became their daily guest, as you know. I think that Mrs. Hermann, from the first, looked upon me as a romantic person. I did not, of course, tear my hair, corum pupolo, over my loss, and she took it for lordly indifference. Afterwards, I dare say, I did tell them some of my adventures, such as they were, and they marveled greatly at the extent of my experience. Hermann would translate what he thought in most, the most striking passages, getting up on his legs as if delivering a lecture on a phenomenon. He had dressed himself with gestures to the two women, who had let their sewing sink slowly on their laps. Meantime, I sat before a glass of Hermann's beer, trying to look modest. Mrs. Hermann would glance at me quickly, emit slight achs. The girl never made a sound, never. But she, too, would sometimes raise her pale eyes to look at me in her unseen, gentle way. Her glance was by no means stupid. It beamed out soft and diffuse as the moon beams upon a landscape quite differently from the scrutinizing inspection of the stars. You were drowned in it, and imagined yourself to appear blurred. And yet the same glance, when turned upon Christian Falk, must have been as efficient as the searchlight of a battleship. Falk was the other assiduous visitor on board, but from his behavior he might have been coming to see the quarter-deck capstan, he certainly used to stare at it a good deal when keeping us company outside the cabin door. With one muscular arm thrown over the back of the chair and his big shapely legs and very tight white trousers extended far out and ending in a pair of black shoes as roomy as punts. On arrival, he would shake Hermann's hand with a mutter, bow to the women, and take up his careless and misanthropic attitude by our side. He departed abruptly, with a jump, going through the performance of grunts, handshakes, bow, as if in a panic. Sometimes, with a sort of discreet and convulsive effort, he approached the women and exchanged a few words with them, half a dozen at most. On these occasions, Hermann's usual stare became positively glassy, 
and Mrs. Hermann's kind countenance would color up. The girl herself never turned a hair. Falk was a Dane, or perhaps a Norwegian, I can't tell now. At all events, he was a Scandinavian of some sort, and a bloated monopolist to boot. It is possible he was acquainted with the word, but he had a clear perception of the thing itself. His tariff of charges for towing ships in and out was the most brutally inconsiderate document of the sort I had ever seen. He was the commander and owner of the only tugboat on the river, a very trim white craft of 150 tons or more, as elegantly neat as a yacht, with a round wheel housing rising like a glazed turret high above her sharp bows and with one slender varnished pole mast forward. I dare say there are yet a few shipmasters afloat who remember Falk and his tug very well. He extracted his pound and a half of flesh from each of us merchant skippers with an unflexible sort of indifference which made him detested and even feared. Schomburg used to remark, I won't talk about the fellow. I don't think he has six drinks from his year's end to year's end in my place. But my advice, gentlemen, don't you have anything to do with him if you can help it. This advice, apart from unavoidable business relations, was easy to follow because Falk intruded upon no one. It seems absurd to compare a tugboat skipper to a centaur, but he reminded me somehow of an engraving in a little book I had as a boy which represented centaurs at a stream, and there was one, especially in the foreground, prancing bow and arrows in hand, with regular, severe features and an immense curled wavy beard flowing down his breast. Falk's face reminded me of that centaur. Besides, he was a composite creature. Not a man-horse, it is true, but a man-boat. He lived on board his tug, which was always dashing up and down the river from early morning till dewy eve. In the last rays of the settling sun, you could pick out, far away, down the reach, his beard borne high up on the white structure, foaming upstream to anchor for the night. There was the white-clad man's body and the rich brown patch of the hair, and nothing below the waist but the thwart ship white lines of the bridge screens that lead the eye to the sharp white lines of the bows cleaving the muddy water of the river. Separated from his boat, to me at least he seemed incomplete. The tug herself, without his head and torso on the bridge, looked mutilated, as it were, but he left her very seldom. All the time I remained in harbor, I saw him only twice on shore. On the first occasion, it was at my charterers, where he came in misanthropically to get paid for towing out a French bark the day before. The second time, I could hardly believe my eyes, for I beheld him reclining under his beard in a cane-bottomed chair in the billiard room of Schomburg's hotel. It was very funny to see Schomburg ignoring him pointedly. The artificiality of it contrasted strongly with Falk's natural unconcern. The big Alsatian talked loudly with his other customers, going from one little table to the other, and passing Fox's place of repose with his eyes fixed straight ahead. Fox sat there with an untouched glass at his elbow. He must have known by sight and name every white man in the room, but he never addressed a word to anybody. He acknowledged my presence by a drop of his eyelids, and that was all. Sprawling there in the chair, he would, now and again, draw the palms of both his hands down his face, giving at the same time a slight, almost imperceptible shudder. It was a habit he had, and of course I was perfectly familiar with it, since you could not remain an hour in his company without being made to wonder at such a movement breaking some long period of stillness. It was a passionate and inexplicable gesture. He used to make it at all sorts of times, as likely as not after he had been listening to little Lena's chatter about the suffering doll, for instance. The Hermann children always besieged him about his legs closely, though, in a gentle way, 
he shrank from them a little. He seemed, however, to feel a great affection for the whole family, for Hermann himself especially. He sought his company. In this case, for instance, he must have been waiting for him, because as soon as he appeared, Falk rose hastily, and they went out together. Then Schomburg expounded in my hearing to three or four people his theory that Falk was after Captain Hermann's niece, and asserted confidently that nothing would come of it. It was the same last year when Captain Hermann was loading here, he said. Naturally, I did not believe Schomburg, but I own that for a time I observed closely what went on. All I discovered was some impatience on Hermann's part. At the sight of Falk, stepping over the gangway, the excellent man would begin to mumble and chew between his teeth something that sounded like German swear words. However, as I've said, I'm not familiar with the language, and Hermann's soft, round-eyed countenance remained unchanged. Staring stolidly ahead, he greeted him with, Why gets? or in English, How are you? with a throaty enunciation. The girl would look up for an instant and move her lips slightly. Mrs. Hermann let her hands rest on her lap to talk volubly to him for a minute or so in her pleasant voice before she went on with her sewing again. Falk would throw himself into a chair, stretch his big legs like as not, draw his hands down his face passionately. As to myself, he was not pointedly impertinent. It was rather as though he could not be bothered with such trifles as my existence. And the truth is that being a monopolist, he was under no necessity to be amiable. He was sure to get his own extortionate terms out of me for towage, whether he frowned or smiled. As a matter of fact, he did neither. But before many days elapsed, he managed to astonish me not a little, and to set Schomburg's tongue clacking more than ever. It came about in this way. There was a shallow bar at the mouth of the river which ought to have been kept down, but the authorities of the state were piously busy gilding afresh the great Buddhist pagoda just then, and I suppose had no money to spare for dredging operations. I don't know how it may be now, but at the time I speak of that sandbank was a great nuisance to the shipping. One of its consequences was that vessels of a certain draft of water, like Hermann's or mine, could not complete their loading in the river. After taking in as much as possible of their cargo, they had to go outside to fill up. The whole procedure was an unmitigable bore. When you thought you had as much on board as your ship could carry safely over the bar, you went and gave notice to your agents. Then in their turn, notified Falk that so-and-so was ready to go out. Then Falk, ostensibly, when it fitted in his other work, but, if the truth were known, simply when his arbitrary spirit moved him, after ascertaining carefully in the office that there was enough money to meet his bill, would come along unsympathetically, glaring at you with his yellow eyes from the bridge, and would drag you out disheveled as to rigging, lumbered as to the decks uh, with unfeeling haste as if to execution, and he would force you to take the end of his own wire hawser, for the use of which there was, of course, an extra charge. To your shouted remonstrances against that extortion, this towering trunk with one hand on the engine room telegraph only shook its bearded head above the splash, the racket, and the clouds of smoke in which the tug, backing and filling in the smother of churning paddle wheels, behaved like a ferocious and impatient creature. He had her manned by the cheekiest gang of less scars I ever did see whom he allowed to bawl at you insolently, and once fast he plucked you out of your berth as if you did not care what he smashed. Eighteen miles down the river you had to go behind him, and then three more along the coast where a group of uninhabited rocky islets enclosed a sheltered anchorage. There we would have to lie at single anchor with your naked spars showing to seaward over these barren fragments of land scattered upon a very intensely blue sea. There was nothing to look at besides but a bare coast. 
the muddy edge of the brown plain with the sinuosities of the river you had left, traced in dull green and the great pagoda, uprising lonely and massive with shining curves and pinnacles like the gorgeous and stony efflorescence of tropical rocks. You had nothing to do but wait fretfully for the balance of your cargo, which was sent out of the river with the greatest irregularity, and it was open to you to console yourself with the thought that, after all, this stage of bother meant that your departure from these shores was indeed approaching at last. We both had to go through that stage, Herman and I, and there was a sort of tacit emulation between the ships as to which should be ready first. We kept on neck and neck almost to the finish when I won the race by going personally to give notice in the forenoon, whereas Hermann, who was very slow in making up his mind to go ashore, did not get the agent's office till late in the day. They told him there that my ship was first on turn for next morning, and I believe he told them he was in no hurry. It suited him better to go the day after. That evening, on board the Diana, he sat with his plump knees well apart, staring and puffing at the curved mouthpiece of his pipe. Presently, he spoke with some impatience to his niece about putting the children to bed. Mrs. Hermann, who was talking to Falk, stopped short and looked at her husband uneasily. But the girl got up at once and drove the children before her into the cabin. In a little while, Mrs. Hermann had to leave us to quell what from the sounds inside must have been a dangerous mutiny. At this Hermann grumbled to himself. For half an hour longer Falk left alone with us fidgeted on his chair, sighed lightly, then at last, after drawing his hands down his face, got up and as if renouncing the hope of making himself understood, he hadn't opened his mouth once, he said in English, Well, good night, Captain Hermann. He stopped for a moment before my chair and looked down fixedly. I may even say glared, and he went so far as to make a deep noise in his throat. There was in all this something so marked that for the first time in our limited intercourse of nods and grunts, he excited in me something like interest. But next moment he disappointed me, for he strode away hastily without a nod even. His manner was usually odd, it is true, and I certainly did not pay much attention to it. But that sort of obscure intention would seem to lurk, and his nonchalance, like a weary old carp in a pond, had never before come so near the surface. He had distinctly aroused my expectations. I would have been unable to say what it was I expected, but all events, I did not expect the absurd developments he sprung upon me no later than the break of the next day. 